part two. On this Thursday, on this particular walk to school, there was an old frog croaking in the stream behind the hedge as we went by. Can you hear him, Danny? Yes, I said. That's a bullfrog calling to his wife. He does it by blowing out his dewlap and letting it go with a burp. What's a dewlap? I asked. It's the loose skin on his throat. I've got some of that. He can blow it up just like a balloon. What happens when his wife hears him? Well, she goes hopping over to him. She's very happy to have been invited, but I'll tell you something very funny about the old bullfrog. He often becomes so pleased with the sound of his own voice that his wife has to nudge him several times before he'll stop his burping and turn round to hug her. That made me laugh. Don't laugh too loud, he said, twinkling at me with his eyes. We men are not so very different from the bullfrog. We parted at the school gates and my father went off to buy the raisins. Other children were streaming in through the gates and heading up the path to the front door of the school. I joined them, but kept silent. I was the keeper of a deep secret and a careless word from me could blow the lid off the greatest poaching expedition the world would ever see. Ours was just a small village school, a squat, meaning um, it wasn't very high, ugly red brick building with no upstairs rooms at all. Above the front door was a big gray block of stone cemented into the brickwork. And on the stone it said, this school was erected in 1902 to commemorate the coronation of his Royal Highness, King Edward VII. I must have read that thing a thousand times. Every time I went to the door, every time I went in the door, it hit me in the eye. I suppose that's what it was there for. But it's pretty boring to read the same old words over and over again. And I often thought how nice it would be if they put something different up there every day. You know, something really interesting. My father would have done it for them beautifully. He could have written it with a bit of chalk on the smooth grey stone and each morning it would have been something new. He would have said things like, did you know that the little yellow clover butterfly often carries his wife around on his back? Another time he might have said, the guppy has funny habits. When he falls in love with another guppy, he bites her on the bottom. Uh, and another time, did you know that the death's head moth can squeak? And then again, birds have almost no sense of smell, but they have good eyesight and they love red colours. The flowers they like are red and yellow, but never blue. Perhaps another time he would get out his chalk and write, some bees have tongues which they can unroll until they are nearly twice as long as the bee itself. This is to allow them to gather nectar from flowers that have very long, narrow openings. Or he might have written, I'll bet you didn't know that in some big English country houses, the butler still has to iron the morning newspaper before putting it on his master's breakfast table. There were about 60 boys and girls in our school and their ages went from five to 11. And we had four classrooms and four teachers. Miss Birdseye taught the kindergarten, the five-year-olds and six-year-olds. And she was a really nice person. She used to keep a bag of aniseed balls in the drawer of her desk. And anyone who did good work would be given one aniseed ball to suck right there and then during the lesson. The trick with aniseed balls is never to bite them. If you keep rolling them around your mouth, they will dissolve slowly of their own accord. And then right in the very centre, you will find a tiny little brown seed. This is the aniseed itself. And when you crush it between your teeth, it has a fabulous taste. My father told me that dogs go crazy about it. When there aren't any foxes around, the huntsman will drag a bag of aniseed for miles and miles over the countryside and the foxhounds will follow the scent because they love it so. This is known as a drag hunt. The seven and eight-year-olds were taught by Mr. Corrado, 
and he was also a, a decent person. He was a very old teacher, probably 60 or more, but that didn't seem to stop him being in love with Miss Birdseye. We knew he was in love with her because he always gave her the best bits of meat at lunch when it was his turn to do the serving. And when she smiled at him, he would smile back at her in the soppiest way you can imagine, showing all his front teeth, top and bottom, and most of the others as well. Here is a picture of Mr. Corrado smiling at Miss uh, Birdseye. A teacher called Captain Lancaster took the nine and ten year olds and this year that included me. Captain Lancaster, known sometimes as Lankers, was a horrid man. He had fiery carrot coloured hair and a little clipped carroty moustache and a fiery temper. Carroty coloured hairs were also sprouting out of his nostrils and his ear holes. He'd been a captain in the army during the war against Hitler, Second World War. And that was why he still called himself Captain Lancaster instead of just plain Mister. My father said it was an idiotic thing to do. There were millions of people still alive, he said, who had fought in that war. But most of them wanted to forget the whole beastly thing, especially those crummy military titles. Captain Lancaster was a violent man and we were all terrified of him. He used to sit at his desk stroking his carroty moustache and watching us with pale watery blue eyes searching for trouble. And as he sat there, he would make queer snuffling grunts through his nose like some dog sniffing round a rabbit hole. Mr Snoddy, our headmaster, took the top class, the 11 year olds, and everybody liked him. He was a small round man with a huge scarlet nose. I felt sorry for him having a nose like that. It was so big and inflamed it looked as though it might explode at any moment and, and blow him up. A funny thing about Mr Snoddy was that he always brought a glass of water with him into class and this he kept sipping right through the lesson. At least everyone thought it was a glass of water. Everyone that is except me and my best friend Sidney Morgan. My father looked after Mr Snoddy's car and I always took the, his repair bills with me to school to save postage. One day, one day during break, I went to Mr Snoddy's study to give him a bill and Sidney Morgan came along with me. He didn't come for any special reason. We just happened to be together at the same time. As he went in, we saw Mr Snoddy standing by his desk, refilling his famous glass of water from a bottle labelled Gordon's Gin. He jumped a mile when he saw us, when he saw us. You should have knocked, he said, sliding the bottle behind a pile of books. Sorry, sir, I said, I, I brought my father's bill. Ah, he said, yes, well, very well. And what do you want, Sidney? Nothing, sir, Sidney Morgan said, nothing at all. Well, off you go then, both of you, Mr Snoddy said, keeping his hand on the bottle behind the books. Run along. Outside in the corridor, we made a pact that we wouldn't tell any of the other children about what we had seen. Mr Snoddy had always been kind to us and we wanted to repay him by keeping his deep, dark secret to ourselves. The only person I told was my father and when he heard it, he said, I don't blame him one bit. If I was unlucky enough to be married to Mrs Snoddy, I would drink something a bit stronger than gin. What would you drink, Dad? Poison, he said. Oh, she's a frightful woman. Why is she so frightful? Well, she's a sort of witch and to prove it, she has seven toes on each foot. How do you know that? Mm, Doc Spencer told me, my father answered. And then to change the subject, he said, why don't you ever ask Sidney Morgan over here to play? Ever since I started going to school, my father had tried to encourage me to bring my friends back to the filling station for tea or supper. And every year, about a week before my birthday, he'd say, let's have a party this time, Danny. We can write out invitations and I'll go into the village and buy chocolate eclairs and doughnuts and a huge birthday cake with candles on it. But I always said no to these suggestions and I never invited any of the other children to come to my home, after school or at weekends. It wasn't because I didn't have good friends, I had lots of them, and some of them were really good friends, especially Sydney. Perhaps if I had lived in the same street as some of them, instead of way out in the country, 
things would have been a bit different. But then again, but then again, perhaps they wouldn't. You see, the real reason I didn't want anyone else to come back and play with me was because I had such a good time being alone with my father. By the way, something horrible happened on that Thursday morning after my father had left me at the school gate and gone off to buy raisins. We were having our first lesson of the day with Captain Lancaster and he had set us a whole bunch of multiplication sums to work out in our exercise books. I was sitting next to Sidney Morgan in the back row and we were both slogging away. Captain Lancaster sat up front at his desk, gazing suspiciously round the class with his watery blue eyes. And even from the back row, I could hear him snoring and snuffling through his nose like a dog outside a rabbit hole. Sidney Morgan covered his mouth with his hand and whispered very softly to me, what are eight nines? 72, I whispered back. Captain Lancaster's finger shot out like a bullet and pointed straight at my face. You, he shouted, stand up. Well, me, sir. Yes, you, you blithering little idiot. I stood up. Imagine a teacher saying that to you. Imagine me saying that to you. I stood up. You were talking, he barked. What were you saying? He was shouting at me as though I was a platoon of soldiers on the parade ground. Come on, boy, out with it. I stood still and said nothing. Are you refusing to answer me? He shouted. Please, sir, Sidney said. It was my fault. I asked him a question. Oh, you did, did you? Stand up. Sidney stood up beside me. And what exactly did you ask him? Captain Lancaster said, speaking more quietly now and far more dangerously. I should probably say that line slightly differently then, shouldn't I? And what exactly did you ask him? I asked him, what are eight nines? And I suppose you answered him, Captain Lancaster said, pointing at me again. He never called any of us by our names. It was always you or boy or girl or something like that. Did you answer him or not? Speak up. Yes, sir, I said. So, you were cheating, he said. Both of you were cheating. We kept silent. Cheating is a repulsive habit practised by gutter snipes and dandy prats, he said. From where I was standing, I could see the whole class sitting absolutely rigid, watching Captain Lancaster. Nobody dared move. You may be permitted to cheat and lie and swindle in your own homes, he went on, but I will not put up with it here. At this point, a sort of blind fury took hold of me and I shouted back at him, I am not a cheat. There was a fearful silence in the room. Captain Lancaster raised his chin and fixed me with his watery eyes. You are not only a cheat, but you are insolent, he said quietly. You are a very insolent boy, which is another word for rude. Come up here, both of you, come up here. As I stepped out from my desk and began walking up towards the front of the class, I knew exactly what was going to happen. I'd seen it happen to others many times, to both boys and girls. But up until now, it had never happened to me. Each time I'd seen it, it had made me feel quite sick inside. Captain Lancaster was standing up and crossing over to the tall bookcase that stood against the left-hand wall of the classroom. He reached up to the topmost shelf of the bookcase and brought down the dreaded cane. It was white, this cane, and as white as bone. Very long, very thin, with one end bent over into a handle like a walking stick. You first, he said, pointing at me with the cane. Hold out your left hand. It was almost impossible to believe that this man was about to injure me physically and in cold blood. As I lifted, lifted my left hand palm towards upwards and held it there, I looked at the palm itself and the pink skin and the fortune teller's lines running over it. And I still could not bring myself to imagine that anything was going to happen to it. The long white cane went high up into the air and came down on my hand with a crack like a rifle going off. I heard the crack first and about two seconds later I felt the pain. Never had I felt a pain such as that in my whole life. It was as though someone were pressing a red hot poker against my palm and holding it there. I remember grabbing my injured left hand with my right hand and ramming it between my legs and squeezing my legs together against it. I squeezed and squeezed as hard as I could, as if I were trying to stop the hand from falling to pieces. 
I managed not to cry out loud, but I couldn't keep the tears from pouring down my cheeks. From somewhere nearby, I heard another fearful swish crack, and I knew that poor Sydney had just got it as well. But oh, that fearful searing, burning pain across my hand. Why didn't it go away? I glanced at Sydney, and he was doing just the same as me, squeezing his hand between his legs and making the most awful face. Go and sit down, both of you, Captain Lancaster ordered. We stumbled back to our desks and sat down. Now, get on with your work, the dreaded voice said, and let us have no more cheating. No more insolence either. The class bent their heads over their books like people in church saying their prayers. I looked at my hand. There was a long, ugly mark about an inch wide, running right across the palm, just where the fingers join the hand. It was raised up in the middle, and the raised part was pure white, with red on both sides. I moved the fingers. Yeah, they all moved all right, but it hurt to move them. I looked at Sydney. He gave me a quick apologetic glance under his eyelids and then went back to his sums. When I got home from school that afternoon, my father was in the workshop. I bought the raisins, he said. We'll now put them into soak. Fetch me a bowl of water, Danny. I went over to the caravan and got a bowl and half filled it with water. I carried it to the workshop and put it on the bench. Open up the packets and tip them all in, my father said. This was one of the really nice things about my father. He didn't take over and want to do everything himself. Whether it was a, a difficult job like adjusting a carburettor in a big engine or whether it was simply tipping some raisins into a basin. He always let me go ahead and do it myself while he watched and stood ready to help. He was watching me now as I opened the first packet. Hey, he cried, grabbing my left wrist. What's happened to your hand? It's nothing, I said, clenching. Clenching your fist is doing this. He made me open it up. The long scarlet mark lay across my palm like a burn. Who did that? He shouted. Was it Captain Lancaster? Yes, Dad, but it's nothing. What happened? He was gripping my wrist so hard it, it almost hurt. Tell me exactly what happened. I told him everything. He stood there holding my wrist, his face going whiter and whiter. And I could see the fury beginning to boil up dangerously inside him. I'll kill him, he says. So he softly whispered when I'd finished. I swear, I'll kill him. His eyes were blazing and all the colour had gone from his face. I'd never seen him look like that before. Forget it, Dad. I will not forget it, he said. You did nothing wrong and he had absolutely no right to do this to you. So he called you a cheat, did he? I nodded. He'd taken his jacket from the peg on the wall and was putting it on. Where are you going? I'm going to Captain Lancaster's house and I'm going to beat the daylights out of him. No, 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 I cried, catching hold of his arm. No, 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 don't do it, Dad, please. It won't do any good. Please, don't do it. I've got to go, he said. No, no, I cried, tugging at his arm. It'll ruin everything. It'll only make it worse. Please, forget it. He hesitated then. I held on to his arm. He was silent and I could see the rush of anger slowly draining out of his face. It's revolting, he said. I'll bet they did it to you when you were at school. Yeah, of course they did. And I'll bet your dad didn't go rushing off to beat the daylights out of the teacher who did it. He looked at me, but kept quiet. He didn't, did he, Dad? No, Danny, he didn't, he answered softly. I let go of his arm and helped him off with his jacket and hung it back on the peg. I'm going to put the raisins in now, I said. And don't forget that tomorrow I have a nasty cold and I won't be going to school. Yes, he said. That's right. We've got 200 raisins to fill, I said. Ah, oh, he said, so we have. I hope we'll get them done in time, I said. Does it still hurt, that hand? No, not one bit. I think that satisfied him, and although I saw him glancing occasionally at my palm during the rest of the afternoon and evening, he never mentioned the subject again. That night, he didn't tell me a story. He sat on the edge of my bunk and we talked about what was going to happen the next day up in Hazel's Wood. He got me so steamed up and excited about it, I couldn't get to sleep. I think he must have got himself steamed up almost as much, because after he had undressed and climbed into his own bunk, I heard him twisting and turning all over the place. He couldn't get to sleep either. At about 10.30, he climbed out of his bunk and put the kettle on. What's the matter, Dad? Nothing. Should we have a midnight feast? Yeah, let's do that. 
He lit the lamp in the ceiling and opened a tin of tuna and made a delicious sandwich for each of us. Also hot chocolate for me and tea for him. And then we started talking about the pheasants and about Hazel's wood all over again. It was pretty late before we got to sleep. Gosh, that was a long session. I didn't want to stop though. I wanted to finish the chapter. That was chapter 12. Tomorrow, chapter 13. It's called Friday. All right. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow.